Welcome to the Value Investor TV podcast. This is the podcast that helps you grow your wealth and become financially independent. My name is Becco and my partner, Ari. How are you doing? <laughs> Long time no see. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. <laughs> Happy New Year. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> Not to you guys. You've you've yeah, been getting you, podcasts you know, yep. oh, every week. Yep. <laughs> we just pre-recorded them for the holidays. Yes, we have. This is the first podcast we've been uh, that we're recording in 2019, so... Happy New Year's to you, Hari. Yeah. We're going to, uh, t- this episode is episode 33. Um, we're going to talk about portfolio management, specifically portfolio management, asset allocation, asset allocation within portfolio management. So we'll talk about that. <coughs> Let's do a quick recap of what we talked about, as we always do. Uh, in last episode 33 and 31, we talked about discounted cash flow. Very important metrics, very important measurement that a lot of people use to project out. Uh, the future cash flow of a company, and that feeds into the valuation of how expensive or how cheap if it is a company. So this kind of cash flow, if you haven't checked that out, please check it out. Okay, in this episode, we're going to talk about portfolio management. This topic is very important because as value investors, we're always trying to look for cheaper, you know, very good companies at a cheap valuation. And so how should I construct my por- portfolio? If I have, t- have $10,000, for example, if I have $100,000, for example, how do you break? How do you? What is the breakdown of of, a, of your portfolio? How much should I hold in cash, and how much how much stocks should I own if I own, if I'm going to if I am going to own stocks? So these are these are type of types of questions that you need to answer for yourself. And broadly speaking, this is what we call portfolio management. So today we'll talk about in this episode we'll talk about asset allocation specifically within portfolio management. And the two topics, so this top, this episode is asset allocation. The next episode we're going to talk about within portfolio management, uh, topic number two is diver- diversification or diversification, we would like to call it. But first, in this episode, let's talk about asset allocation. So tell us, Hari, why is al- asset allocation so important and, and what is it before before uh, you jump into that? <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, if you if you talk to a investment advisor or you know, financial advisor, what they would tell you is asset allocation is, you know, you put so much percentage of your net worth in stocks, in bonds, in mutual funds, in uh, your real estate, gold, you know, all, all of these different, you know, areas of your portfolio and that your net worth is made up of all of these different assets and that in order to minimize your risk, uh, you kind of you know, diversify across a bunch of different assets. And as, and, you know, when you, when you think about that, that sounds good on paper, right? And this is actually, you know, something that's been, um, you know, talked about, you know, heavily, um, for the last 50 or 60 years is that asset allocation is the most important part of portfolio management. And, you know, the, the irony of that is that in a, in a value investing, value investing world, you know, the actual things that you own are important, right? It's not, you know, the asset allocation is important too, right? But what what most value investors would look at is what are the best assets that have the ability to to grow over time uh, and, you know, are are routinely undervalued that you can find, you know, readily and exit out of quickly, right? And that's stocks, right? And so, you know, when you think about it from a real estate perspective, and we've talked about real estate as there's nothing necessarily wrong about investing in real estate, right? The problem is, is that it's not a very liquid market. Um, the price of your, you, you know, the, the value of your asset in real estate is heavily dependent on something that's completely out of your control, which is interest rates. Um, you know, if you look at gold, you know, you have a bar of gold, you stick it in a safe, you come back a year later, you know, you don't have 10% more gold right? You just have the same bar that you had a year ago. So the asset can't change or, you know, or, you know, or, or grow. So you have to, you know, what is the best use, you know, of, of that? And so, you know, when you look at, you know, people talk about this and this goes back even to, you know, when Ben Graham wrote The Intelligent Investor, you know, he talked about asset allocation as, you know, you know, what percentage of stocks, what percentage of bonds and, and that was it, right? It was, and it, it, you know, so people would move their asset uh, depending on where the market was, and you know how uh, easy it was to find uh, cheap stocks to buy. So in a 
in a if you can find a lot of cheap stocks, then you put more assets into stocks, right? And yeah. that was Ben Graham's kind of you know, in a lot of ways it's it's goes against a lot of what people, you know, are are telling you right now if you go to a financial advisor, they would tell you 20% in you know, you know, don't put more than 10% in stocks because stocks are risky and volatile, uh, volatile and that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, and what you know, when you when you think about all of those things, it it really gets down to the heart of the matter is how good are you at actually valuing these investment um, vehicles? Right? Yeah, and and that really gets to the heart of value investing, which yeah. is value investing is if you don't understand what you're doing, don't do it. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I, I want to touch on the on the point that you mentioned um, about having gold or, or, or mutual funds real estate, all the all these things in your portfolio. And it kind of goes back to our, our first discussion, one of our first episodes that, that covered why why invest in companies. And so you if you haven't listened to that episode, check that out because we talk about this, what would Hari just talked about in detail, why stocks are the best vehicles for, for value creation, for wealth generation. Right. And so if you haven't listened to the episode, please check it out. So that's what Hari's talking about here in, ter- in terms of like why stocks are the best vehicles to generate wealth. Yeah. And so asset allocation, like you said, <clears throat> stocks are very, very important. It's important to invest in it because it gives you the best returns and it's something that you can value as a value investor. Yep. We need to be able to put in our money in things that we can understand and can project out the future. And so that's very, very important in, uh, in asset allocation. Um, so, I mean, if you want to think about it an, another way, and I, I think this may be a more concrete example that kind of illustrates how ludicrous, you know, it can get. So imagine if you were Jeff Bezos in 1995, right? You had start Amazon with, you know, whatever cash you have available. <clears throat> and then he went to your financial advisor and said, whoa, 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 whoa buddy, you've got 100% of your net worth in this Amazon business, right? And if you have 100% of your business, you know, your net worth in Amazon, you should diversify away and buy real estate and gold, right? Well, so th- then let's say he, he sold half of his Amazon, you know, uh, portfolio, right? Well, he would be worth, I mean, that would have cost him hundreds of bill, you know, multi-billion Billions. dollars, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about it, there are lots of the pe- the wealthiest people in the world have 100% of their net worth in one stock, Right. I mean, if you don't get more concentrated than that. So the idea is that, but they know that business very well, probably yeah. because they're managing it and they're running it, yeah. right? So, you know, just to finish that point, you know, asset allocation really comes down to, you know, how com- you know how good are you at assessing the actual value of that business? And I would argue that over a long period of time, you're you're if you are able to you know get good at this and understand the business that you know the market always will value the stock at its fair value at yeah. some point yeah and always i think you know when we talk about asset allocation a lot of people talk about oh, how much cash should i have what is the percentage of stocks should i own and that's always the question that people have right and now that's the kind of questions that i always kind of tinker with as well if you look at you know, a lot of these people out there who are commentating on the stock market and the investors, people will say, oh, look at Warren Buffett. Don't listen to what he's saying. Actually look at what he's doing. And that's yep. the source of the truth. And, and they look at they look at uh, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway's balance sheet and say and says, hey, look, look at all this. Look at all this cash. Mm-hmm. He's not holding it. Li- he's not holding a lot of stocks. Look at all this cash that he's generating. He's not putting it back into the market. What does that tell you? And that kind of. Th- and that kind of question that people have in their mind and say, "Oh, look, Warren Buffett's not holding, you know, his, whole, his holding a lot of cash in his, in his balance sheet. That means that I should. That's the rate. That's the percentage of stock of stock and cash balance that I need to have in my portfolio." And I think if you know how to value a business, like for example, Bezos, for example, if you know how to, if you know how, if you know your business very well, there's no need to find this optimal balance like cash and stocks there's no really an optimal balance between cash and stocks if you as long as you know how to balance as long as you know how to understand a business and find the right business to put in the, put in your money cash you know the the rate the percentage of cash you need to have in your portfolio there's not a there's not an ideal mix yeah i, I think there's you know let's 
break down, you know, a couple of things that you, you mentioned there. You know, one of those um, things about Warren Buffett is, first of all, none of us is Warren Buffett. <laughs> all right. None of us runs a $500 billion company, right? Yeah. There are only like four people who do or yeah. five people who do, yeah. right? And, you know, so the way that Buffett really thinks about it is, you know, you look at it and you say, oh, he's got $100 billion in cash. That's true. He does have $100 billion in cash. But he also has the the burden of not being able to deploy that cash effectively. Like if he went out and bought a billion dollar company, right, it wouldn't even make a dent in his portfolio, yeah. right? So even if he found a bunch of undervalued stocks and they were all $500 million to $2 billion or $3 billion, there's not enough. I mean, he, he, he could buy a lot of those and he would, you know, he would add to his portfolio of, you know, of, of workhorse stocks. But at the end of the day, none of those stocks has, would make a dent in his yeah, portfolio. It's right? crazy to think about. Now, the other thing is that you have to understand with Buffett is he does not actively go out to seek investments, right? People come to him with an investment. He, and he does this for a lot of different reasons. One is that he is not a he doesn't act is not an activist type investor. When he puts his money down, he he will happily give control of his voting rights to the CEO if he you know because that's how he he you know he behaves. It's like you know the business better than I do. Yep. Let you you know you I'm my vote of confidence is if I'm investing that I'm investing alongside the CEO. I let him or her decide you know how to invest the money, right? So. The idea that, you know, listening to Warren Buffett when he was much younger, I think is much more valuable, right? And listening to him now, it's a lot more difficult to follow what he's saying because he's he's operating in a completely different scale, right? He can't ask, you know, allocate as much capital, you know, to an inv individual investment that, you know, I, I can safely say that no amount of money that I have would be able to buy a publicly traded company, right? He the amount of money that he has would, you know, he could buy, in, you know, a, a giant chunk of chunk of the, you know, Russell 5000, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> that concept is not a, um, it's not a good way to measure, right? And now when you listen to what he says, he says a lot of good things like, you know, you should have cash available when, you know, the market comes down so that, you know, you know, when, it, when it's raining gold, you yeah. want to have a bathtub, not a thimble, right? So, but that raining gold concept is is essentially when there is cheap stocks to be had, you should have cash available, right? If you looked in like October of 2018, right, you would have probably found very few stocks to find that are, you know, attractive, right? I, I, when I look, I maybe find one good investment a year, right? They're not, they're not a lot of them. Now, what happens is when you're trying to allocate your capital you have to look at your individual you know stocks as what do i own now in my portfolio and is it undervalued still if it's undervalued still then i'm i'm happy to hold on to it um and if it's overvalued i may consider selling um if it's significantly overvalued i may sell and just hold cash right but then there's a third aspect of this which is if there's another great business that comes along and I find that I have a, val a company that's maybe 90% of its fair value, so fairly close, I may sell it out to buy this undervalued stock that's only trading at 50% of its fa fair value. Yep. So, so really, in my mind, asset allocation comes down to, at, at a small scale, it comes down to how much cash do you have um, or how many available good investment ideas are there? And when those investment ideas are undervalued, I should be able to, you know, purchase, you know, um, you know, uh, chunks of shares, and I may want to save some cash later to go and buy more, you know, in case it comes down even further, right? So you may want to, you may say, I have a hundred, you know, ten thousand dollars, let's say, and the stock comes down in price, it's undervalued. You put in seventy five hundred dollars. And then you wait on that other twenty five hundred dollars. If it goes down even further, you can you know lower your uh, average, average cost. cost. Yeah. But if it goes up, you don't put that twenty five hundred dollars into it, right? And so, 
the answer is there is no answer here. It's it's hard, right? But if you always buy undervalued stocks, you are going to do better. Um, yeah. Uh, so in that in that scenario, in that scenario, let's say you have, to, you, have you put in seventy five percent of your cash into this, right? In that scenario, you're just talking about with ten thousand dollars, you're putting seventy five hundred into a stock. How do you determine that seventy five percent? You know, is it is it fifty dollars? Is it is it you know fifty percent, seventy nine percent, ninety percent? If it's cheaply valued at that po- at that point in time, you could just go ahead and deploy one hundred percent of it too. You can, and what you what you want to see is, and I don't I don't look at trading history. I don't look at any of that stuff because, I mean, it doesn't tell you what the price is going to be tomorrow, right? Um, now, but the fundamentals will tell you what the price will be in three years, right? And that's what you're kind of waiting for is, so. There's a couple ways of thinking about it. One is that when you're buying into a stock, you may buy chunks, like you may be 25, 25, 25, 25 on you know a weekly basis. Um, but it every every time that you're purchasing, it's always below your threshold, right? That threshold is this is the margin of safety price. Under that price, at any price under that price, I'm willing to buy. Yeah. Right. And so so at that point when it's it's under that price. You know, you can space it out over a week, a month. Yeah. If it's truly like one of those things, there are some times where it hits an extreme undervalued target that you just really want to pounce, right? And that at that level, it's just go you know, time. Go time. You yeah. do 100%. So I can't say that there's like a, there's Ideal, a good rule. Yeah, rule right? to it. Yeah. You know, and if you, if you look at the way that, you know, if you have a lot of money to deploy, you kind of have to drop it over time anyway, right? A lot of the, like if you ha- run a yeah, fund, you yeah. know, like Monish Pabrai and stuff like that, they may buy daily in the market, yeah. you know, like 2% of their yeah. position yeah. Uh, and slowly build up to it. Maybe I think maybe a better question here would be, what do you do, Hari? You know, what, what do you do? Do you usually space it out or do you just pounce at once or how do you, what is your style? So let's I, say you found a great stock, and it's under that threshold, under that you know intrinsic value, that margin of safety threshold, and the stock is hovering around right there, right below the threshold. Great company. Do you let's say you wanted to buy ten, you know, let's say you wanted to buy ten percent of your portfolio into this company. Within that ten percent, do you deploy all that ten percent right away, or do you do five percent first and then another two percent, another two percent, another another one percent? Yeah. So before I answer that, let me let me instead explain to you what my mistakes have been in the past. Yeah. Sure. Right. Because I think that actually is more yeah. illustrative of why I've come to this ridiculous situation that I'm in right now. Yeah. Which is the way I look at it is the way I used to do it was I've determined that this stock is good, it's undervalued, and then I'll buy some tranche, twenty five, twenty percent of my portfolio, and then at that point I've now mentally put psychologically have i mean into this stock yeah, you're anchored and so i'm like well it doesn't matter anymore what price i'm paying i've already bought in because i'm right. now averaging my price in into this yeah. and my average price will be below this yeah. so when i started and i did that for a number of years and what you notice is it knocks out about two or three percent of your overall returns or it potentially um you know because of the way that you you know when you start doing that you're you're thinking to yourself, if I bought it in at twenty dollars a share, let's say that the 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 fair value of the stock is forty dollars a share, my margin of safety price is twenty dollars a share, and then I bought it in at, at twenty, or, or it's now trading at eighteen dollars. So I I put in twenty five percent. It kind of trickles up to twenty one, and I I panic because I think, oh man, it's you know you it's going to just yeah. skyrocket from here. You lost it, yeah. Right, and then it goes up to twenty four, and I'm like, now I'm really panicking, yeah. right? And what what ends up happening is, you now your average price is twenty two dollars yeah. a share instead of, you know, under your fair value, right? Yeah. And so instead now what I've done is, and and I I recommend this to everybody is you know this is something Warren Buffett did uh, has said. And I, I, I wish I could remember which – it was in some lecture that he was talking to some college students mm-hmm. that he mentioned this. Yep. Um, and I wish I knew which college he was talking about so you could find it on YouTube. But he essentially says you take a piece of paper and you write down your investment thesis and then you put down your fair value price. 
and then you just stare at that that number. Whenever it comes down time to to look at your brokerage account and click on a you know on the the buy or sell button, you look at that fair value price, <clears throat> and you and if it's below that fair value price, it's okay to buy, and if it's above that fair value price, you don't buy it, right? And I, I will tell you there there are times where you know I I, I was I. I was super strict about this, you know, and at various times of my investing career, I've been more strict and less strict Mm -hmm. where I, there was a company, um, it was called MWI veterinary, uh, MWIV was the ticker and they sold, you know, animal, you know, products, uh, veterinary to, they were a supplier of, you know, vet clinics and stuff. And this company was just growing like crazy, high return on capital, fantastic, you know, business, but it was expensive. And it, you know, it was like two or three dollars above my mm. uh, margin of safety price, and 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 that was with you know all of this. And I was just like, please, just come down mm-hmm. a little bit more. Yep. Please come down. It's just just a little too expensive. Yep. And and it never got to that price. Mm. And then it went from that to you know, it sold to another company at one hundred and fifty percent of that. It would have been a you know. I would have easily doubled, you know, almost tripled my money, yep. you know, from that that price. And those are going to happen all the time yep. to you. And you can just sit there and wallow about it and cry and all this like you missed this opportunity, you found a great company whatever. But value investing is about absolutes. It's not relatives, it's not, you know, you know this this idea oh, it's relatively cheap or whatever. It has to meet a certain threshold. And if it's that threshold that you set, it's and which is a very rigid and conservative threshold, then that's how you ma- maximize your returns, right? Over a long period of time, you stick to that your guns very, very, you know, uh, soundly. Yeah. And if I and you know, I, there have been times where I, I have paid attention to that very closely, and it's made me more money because I've I've avoided the you know, you know the that. Uh, paying too much for for a stock. Yeah. So I would highly encourage you to to make make that a a priority when you invest. Is your asset allocation should really be based on what is the the margin of safety price, right? So not not the fair value, but you know a, a percentage of that price. So half, you know, if you use a fifty percent margin of safety, which I think is a pretty good number to use, then you're below a threshold. At at which point. You're you're indifferent really to the price that you're paying as long as it's below that price. Yeah, and so it makes it there is no good answer to what you're yeah. originally getting to, yeah. right? But as but there but if you stick to if you adhere to that price threshold, you're always uh, at least uh, preserving your value. In, uh, exactly. So going back to the original question about like how you know how to allocate cash, how to deploy cash when in fact the company that you're you're interested in goes this below that 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 margin of safety price you know at that point like 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 you said Harry you're indifferent about how you deploy that cash you can deploy it 50% now and then 25% later and, and another 25% later it all depends on your personality what you want you know what kind of how do you want how how you, how, how you want to play the market but important thing we want to highlight with the example that you gave is that you you stay conservative you stay disciplined with a margin of safety, yeah, because I, I think there's a there's a lot of people who are going to do these things, and you'll see that when you read articles on like Seeking Alpha or you're you're on stock twits and and you know people are like I'm going to play the earnings, like I'll wait, I'll buy before earnings, I buy after earnings, all of that stuff. All of those things you can't time the market. You, you know you may you may win, you may lose, um, but none of those reasons is is a good reason to to do that right you you should be thinking about it purely from the perspective of this is the valuation this is what i'm going to pay and i'm not going to pay any more than that price right and and then that means if you do that you will stick to your guns you will succeed over the long haul right so in this episode we talked about asset allocation that's part of the portfolio management strategy in value investing and we talked about you know different assets that we could put into but most importantly stocks you know, we, we came to the conclusion that stocks is the vehicle to grow your wealth. And that's really the only vehicle that value investors should put money into. We talked about that earlier on the episode. And then 
From there, we talked about cash balance. So how much cash should be hold? And if we find a good company below that intrinsic price, how much cash should we deploy? You know, what is, what, at, at what rate? Uh, we talked about that. And lastly, we talked about the same, same discipline part of things, right? If you find a company, if you find a good company undervalued at a, at a price that you deem is way below that intrinsic value, um, staying disciplined to that price uh, threshold is very important in value investing. So we talked about all those things under the umbrella of asset allocation, portfolio management. Okay, this was episode 33. Um, anything else you want to add before we move on to episode 34? <clears throat> all right. Uh, I don't think so. I, I think just, uh, you know, I, I, what I would say about this is this is asset allocation is where a lot of value investors will diverge. It doesn't mean that there's there is a right or wrong way, you know, but I, what, what I would tell you is, you know, it's always good to, to preserve your, you know, have some cash available if you can, you know, to, to, so that you can deploy when it really is raining gold. Yeah. Right. So that may mean that you buy less of a stock that you would, you would want to yeah. so that you can preserve some cash, which yeah. may, may also mean that it allows you to buy more of that stock later. Yeah. Right. But if you, Think about it from the perspective of protecting against the downside risk, which is the most important part of value investing. Then, you know, as Warren Buffett says, rule number one, yep. don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. That's that's it, right? Is It's really preserving your cash is also a good buffer against losing money in some scenarios, yeah, right? Exactly. All right, that's it for us. Episode 33, guys. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.